Hello and welcome to Lessons from Learning Leaders. I'm your host, Dwayne Lester. Today, we're going to be talking to a man named Tony Sanders. Now, I'll tell you the story of how I came to know who Tony Sanders was and what he does in the podcast itself. But this this one, this one's going to be a little bit different because one thing that I know that a lot of training professionals want to do, you know, a lot have this thought in their mind. What if I would just do this for myself? I mean, we go to the conferences, we see the folks there, the people we've had on this podcast, folks like Sardik Love, who are out there doing it themselves. Well, Tony Sanders is doing it himself too. So we're going to talk about how he made the transition from sales professional to innovative training leader. We're going to walk through how to make that that move, what he does, and the advice he has for us in making that adjustment. So I think you're going to like it. You're in for a treat. I will tell you this. I recorded this podcast on the road. I mean, literally in a closet, what felt like a sauna at the DC's national airport. So the video quality on my end, not what we're up to uh, usually. Tony looks great though, I'll tell you that. But the video quality is rough for me. Sound quality should be on point. But whether you're listening to this in your commute or in your home office or at work, you're in for a treat. Tony was a great guest. I think you're going to enjoy listening to this as much as I enjoyed recording it. Here's the thing. I'm kind of a lurker on that uh, training subreddit. Okay. And I I just kind of read a lot of the stuff that I do there is really, I look at what people are asking questions about, and then I'll write an article, try to answer that question. I love it. Strategy. And so I'm sitting there and I'm looking through it one day and I see this question, what's stopping you from starting your own training company? And then I'm like, since when did my conscience start posting on Reddit, right? Because <laughs> this is a question that, that nags at you, right? Why sure. aren't you doing this yet? Why aren't you doing this yet? And I guess, yeah. you know, when you look at lessons from learning leaders, that's a bit of a training company. It's more of a media, but it's related to training. It's related to, to helping learning leaders get better at being learning leaders. Sure. But But you continue on and you say, for those of you who already work in learning and development, especially as a one person team, have you ever thought about starting your own training company or even being a freelance trainer? Then you say, I did this a few years ago and have made more money in less time. And honestly, with fewer corporate headaches. So I got to, I want to get to that. I want to get to how you did that. But first I want you to tell me about yourself. Tell me your story. Yeah. I did not start off as um, a training guy. In fact, I never, I never really knew for sure what I wanted to be when I was growing up as a kid. I would I would list all these things. You know, they ask you that in school, like, what do you want to be when you when you grow up? And I would say these random things. But really what I was saying is I wanted to be on TV. So whatever TV show I watched last, I would just list that thing. So I watched Jurassic Park and I came back and I was like, I want to be a paleontologist. And they're like, whoa, that's a big word. You know how to do that? And then I'd watch uh, the, you know, my parents would watch the weather uh, in the morning before school. And I'm like, I want to be a meteorologist. (laughs) They'd buy me books on clouds and they'll study cumulus clouds and all these things. And then, you know, that, that kind of kept going, but I always knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Right. So it's like whatever arena I decide to go in, whenever I decide I'm going to own the business of the work that I do. And so that has kind of been my, my makeup, I guess. My grandparents on both sides were entrepreneurs in different ways, but my grandmother on my dad's side was really influential in my entrepreneurial journey. And I don't know if she knew it or not, but she taught me how to sell when I was a kid. And so she would teach me these great like sales principles, which as a, as a kid, you know, your grandmother's just talking to you, you're listening or trying to listen or whatever you know, trying to get whatever you want from grandma, right? Like, I just want a piece of candy, grandma. I don't want this. (laughs) But she was teaching me all these things. And so when I got older, I'm like old enough to work. Um, You know, I I was the kid that like sold candy in school. And then I had my own vending machine company and I have a lawn care company and a window cleaning. So I just always was very entrepreneurial. Um, But I, but I love sales because I kind of got that from my, my grandmother. And so I started out like as a sales guy, right? And that was like my angle. And that was actually my introduction into training. I never planned to be a trainer, never wanted to be a trainer. It was almost like I got tricked into it, which we could talk about <laughs> if you like, but 
but yeah, man, that that's really my story. I was just a kid who really wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, I feel like I've I've I don't want to say chase that dream, but like I've done that at every step of my life. Looking back on it, I remember when eBay came out. Like I was the kid that would go around and go to my. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know how to go to garage sales yet, so I would just go to my family's houses and just. <laughs> Do you guys still use that? They're like, no, not really. It's like, do you mind if I have it? And like, no, I guess not. And then I come back and it's like, listen, that thing that you didn't want anymore, I sold it for a hundred dollars on eBay. And they were like, what? Give me my cut. And I was like, okay. <laughs> now I can't tell people anymore. I just ask them and then I don't tell them about the results. But that was that was always my thing. And so when I did eventually get into the training world through a series of events, I saw a business opportunity there. Um, and, and that was probably the only way I could do it long-term anyway. And so that's kind well, of, there's a man, his name escapes me and I can see his face. Uh, he wrote a book to, to sell as human and I'll think of his name, the, the name of the author, as soon as this podcast is over, guarantee it, we'll hang up and I'll be like, Oh, is that guy, the guy I always talk about, but yeah. in this, in, in the book to sell as human, he says, I think he says like 30%, 25, 30% of people work in direct sales. The mm. rest of us work in indirect sales. Like we're <laughs> always selling. We're always selling something. So we, when you think about sales in relation to training, I, I like to tell people training is just another form of sales. That's what exactly. I'm trying to do. I'm trying to sell you that this way of doing things is better. Or I'm trying to train you that this piece of equipment can do this better. Or I'm trying to train you that, you know, you probably shouldn't treat your coworkers like that. This way of treating your coworkers is yeah. better. So it's all about sales. Did you find that that what your grandma taught you and what you learned about sales related directly to what you're doing in training? One thousand percent. That's actually how I got tricked into training. So I'll tell you, um, I worked at this company and, and within the first 90 days there, I became the number one salesperson in the company. And so the vice president of sales came down and he's like, uh, he took me to, to lunch across the street. And he's like, I, I want to tell you two things. Number one, we listen to all of your calls and we know you're not cheating because if you, if you get that good at sales at a new place and no one knows you or where you came from, I wasn't like a referral, like no one knew me. I just random guy walked in one day. Now he's the top of the leaderboard. He's probably cheating. Right. So they made sure that I wasn't cheating. But they also said, like, you're doing some things that are really different from what other salespeople do. And if you would like be interested in teaching other people how to do that, like that would mean a lot to us. And I'm like, well, I don't know how to train. I don't know how to teach. And, and, and we had the conversation and it clicked for me. It's like, well, it's still sales. Just your product is now this new sales process. Or your product is now these new ideas that you're bringing to the table or these best practices or this certain mindset that it takes to achieve what you need them to achieve. So it's still sales. It's actually, get this, it's actually a higher level of sales because there's no real physical exchange. It's like, usually when you sell something to someone, there's a physical exchange. They walk away with the widget and you walk away with the dollars or they walk away having received a service that they could visually see and you walk away with an invoice or contract or whatever, whatever the, the situation is. This, there's no physical exchange. Like the only way that you get to see the return on the sale that you made is when people go and make action. And so right. I came into training with the idea of like my job is to drive results. I, like if I didn't, if I hold, if I hold a training class and the people that left that class didn't do something different, I didn't train them. I didn't sell them properly. So I gotta go, I gotta go do the training again. I didn't know that that made me very different <laughs> in, in the, in the training world. I just was using my sales brain that I always had and just said, okay, like the purpose of training for me is going to be SSDS, right? Same for sales. You got to say something so people do something. And like, that's well, how I've always approached it. And that's worked really well for me in the training space. Yeah, you're absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right. When you say that you're selling something, you, you're selling this idea and it, it and it is, it is so much, I, I'll say more difficult because you can sell, you can sell someone a Corvette because they're going to be like, yeah, I can, I can see myself in this Corvette. They can see yeah. the Corvette. They can get in the Corvette. Right. Yeah. You say, actually, this process is better. You got to you got to overcome maybe decades of status quo bias. They're like, no, this is the way we've always done it. 
I don't know who you think you are, you know, uh, young kid coming in here telling me how to do things. How do you think you know more than me? That is so much more difficult a sale than saying, why don't you just buy this? It does a thousand things more. So when you, when you get into that, did, what kind of barriers and obstacles did you have to overcome? I definitely had that, right? I had one guy that uh, I was in charge of training and coaching and giving him feedback. And he was always like uh, unhappy with whatever I told him. Right? And I got the sense that he just didn't want to like be bothered by me. But I have a rule when it comes to coaching or when it comes to training, like everybody's going to get feedback. Everybody's going to get a, an opportunity to get better. And that is my rule. Like that is my charge. I take responsibility of that. And it doesn't matter if you've been doing this for a thousand years or if this is your first time ever doing this. I'm going to I'm going to make sure that you get the opportunity to get better. And so I sat him down one day. His name was Steve. And I'm like, Steve, I'm having a hard time connecting with you. And he's like, yeah, duh. Right? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I don't know what it is. Like you're you're a part of my my team. We have these training groups that we were responsible for their performance. You're part of my team. I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to give you the opportunity to develop, but it just doesn't seem like you want that. So like let's have a conversation about that. And he said, Sonny, he called me Sonny, which is like, you know, very yeah. respectful, but not That's really aggressive right out of the gate. He's like, Sonny, I've been doing this longer than you've been sucking wind. Like that's wow. what he said to me. Yeah. And he basically told me that he didn't need my help. And I was like, you know what, Steve, I appreciate that. And I said, I think that you're a very good salesperson. I think that the processes and the tactics and things that you use are really, really good. But I just have to let you know that I'm going to train you and coach you anyway. And here's the deal we can make. Like, I'm not going to approach you as if you don't know something. Here's my approach. I'm going to say things that will either remind you of something that you knew before that you forgot or recenter your focus on something that you know, but you're just not doing right now. And if we can agree to one of those two things, because I'm listening to it, I'm watching you, like you're not doing, if we can agree to one of those two things, like let, that will be our coaching. And he was like, you know what? I think that that's fair. And we, we were able to like build a relationship, but that was one of those, those obstacles of just like, I've been doing this this way for 30 years. And now here you come trying to sell me something different. Like, I don't, I'm not interested in that. And so I, I felt like I had to become and did become a better salesperson because it was a different type of sale with no physical product. You have to overcome all of this, um, you know, head trash or whatever you'd like to call it. Like all of these mental blocks that you have to get people through. Um, but that's what made it fun, right? Like, like I, I realized really quickly that I wasn't just training people on the skills to use. I had to train them mentally to become the person that the skills would work for, right? And so if, if I could help them become the person, using the skills is going to be easy, right? Because now you have the right, you have the right mind to, to be able to do it, right? So whenever I trained, I go mindset first, then skill set. Because if you don't have the right mindset, the skill set won't matter. A lot that of people, could've... they try to train tool set. Like, here's here's the tactics and tools of what you do. And it's like, cool, but they're never going to do it because you didn't give them the mind to do it, right? So they're not the person that could use those tools. They're like, that's cool. And they may even tell you they want tools. But the truth is, like, you have to have the mindset, then the skill set, then the tool set. That, there's a lot there to, to unpack. But that first thing I thought was that could have gone so differently. Could have gone so – because when you said – when you said – I've been doing this, since, you know, since before you were sucking wind. My first thought was, well, you think your numbers would be better then. But you say that, <laughs> that's a whole different conversation yeah, after that, is. right? <laughs> and But but you you said something that reminded me of a conversation that I was having with, with one of the new people in our training department today. We were, we were talking. And I said, look, there's three ways you can come at this training. Okay, there's three ways trainers can do this. They can focus on the content. You know, you can focus on the content and make the content paramount. And that's what you're talking Here's the tools. It's all about the tools. What about the tools? Here's, you can focus on the content. You can be content centered. Or we've seen instructors like this. They can be self-centered. They're focused on the instructor. I I've come into this room to show you how good I am. Mm -hmm. And at the end of this training, you're going to see why you should respect. You're going to see why I have this job. I'm that good. And by the end of this, you're all going to be really impressed with me. Yeah. Or you can do like you're talking about. 
and you can be focused on the people in that room, That's which right. is the way you should. And, you know, you don't come into this and say, I've got all this content to get through. So sit down and be quiet and don't ask questions. You don't come into this and say, I've got this content and I've got so much to tell you. I'm just that good. You come in and you say, okay, let's get your minds right. Let's get, see what you need. Let's see where we can help you get better because it's all about them. And that, from that story you told right out of the gate, you, you knew that. And that's amazing. That's a fantastic job. Yeah, that, that's always my favorite part of speaking. I did a keynote earlier today. And my my favorite part, like I, I've gotten to the point where I negotiate in, if there's not one already, time for Q&A. Because like I'm going to do a great job of researching the audience and making sure I know what they need. And I'm going to get it. I'm going to get like all my information guided towards what I believe that those people in that room need to hear that day. But at best, it's an educated guess. When I do Q&A, now I know I'm helping them. Because mm -hmm. they have a direct need or problem that they get the opportunity to ask me about and I get the opportunity to help them like that fires me up. And so I'll go on stage and talk for an hour. But like what I'm really interested in the last 15 to 30 minutes of Q&A or when I get off the stage, the, the line of people that come to say, hey, you said this thing. Let me ask you a question. I've got this boss or I've got this person in my class or I've got this leader. Like I, those are the conversations that I treasure because I know I'm hitting the mark. Right. I know I'm actually helping people with the problem they care about not just what i think or assume they care about and even worse what i care about because nobody That's, cares about what i care about right amen <laughs> amen well said so let's let's move on so you're doing this training you're teaching people how to sell you're teaching them how to improve their numbers yeah and then what do you just you just like this isn't it i got to do more i've got to do this for myself what what was the catalyst when what what was the spark that said it's time to do my own thing yeah, I was working with them on uh, doing classroom training and I told them like, hey, I know what's broken here and it's not really the classroom training aspect of it. Like ours, our sales process is pretty good, but how we train people on it is horrible. And our new hire training process was literally this, and this is not a joke. It was a six page script <laughs> and the trainer gave it to people and said, read this before you go to bed put it under your pillow, wake up, read it again, do that every day. And by the end of the week, if you have it memorized, you can start selling. And that What's wrong was with that. What's and wrong then with that, Tony? put on like the world <laughs> cup or something. That wow. was like literally, that was like literally the training. And there's so many different things wrong with that. Like one yeah. of the things I don't like about sales scripts, like the reason why they don't work is because the customers didn't get their copy. They don't know their lines. Right. And so you're like, OK, I'm going to say this and the customer's going to say that. And then they don't say it. And you're like, ah, I don't know what to do. And so I, I took that that six page sales script and I created a four step sales process. And then we created training for new hires around this process. Like, is it easier to remember four steps or six pages of words? I think it's probably easier to remember four steps. Yeah. So let's train these people on the four steps. Let's get them to a point where they're actually doing the thing and not learning or hearing about the thing, right? Um, a lot of the formal education systems taught us that learning was uh, collecting knowledge, but that's not learning. That's just collecting knowledge, connecting mm -hmm. information. Learning is actually going to be able to do the thing. And the, there are certain lessons you can only learn by going to do the thing that you're trying to learn. So like, let's get them doing the thing faster and let's, let's put it into this process. And then we can measure and monitor and train to and even coach better to this process, right? When I'm coming to coach you, I can't say, hey, man, on page five of the script, you didn't say these three words. I can go to you and say, hey, it's, that the call was really good. You nailed step one and two. Step three is where it fell apart. And it, it, it like aligned everything and boiled it down to like something really, really simple. And so we implement this, this process and how we're going to train it. And we built systems around it and all these things. And um, we wrote it out and it was successful. And we're, we're really happy about it. And one of the, the VPs of finance told me the best thing and the worst thing that I probably ever heard at work. We were standing around and it was like end of the night. Like I should have been gone already, but I was just hanging out. And we're, we are looking at like all the assets that we made for the training. And we're looking at the numbers and it looks great. And he's like, hey, just so you know, like every percent increase we have in close rate is a million dollars in revenue. And since you've rolled this out, the new hire close rate has went up 3%. We're about to change the goals. 
So like you just made the company three million dollars in the first quarter of this rollout. And at the time, my salary was fifty thousand dollars. There it is. And that year, not only was my salary fifty, it was fifty plus bonuses. But like, not only was it not only was it fifty, um, I didn't get a bonus that year because I got promoted. And if you didn't stay in a position for longer than six months, you, like it was a weird thing. Yeah. Um, and and like I got like a gift card to like a steakhouse or something, and I'm like, okay. That was cool. I'm glad I know I could do that because I before that I didn't know I could do that, right? But then that kind of got the wheels turning of like, I need to find ways to do this for other companies because if I just got a tenth of that instead of my fifty thousand dollars salary, like that would be a really nice day. Mm -hmm. That's what initially sparked the idea. I didn't go uh, forward and formalize the company until a couple of years later, but that was the the genesis of it. Of like, okay. I'm going to do, I'm going to do this on my own. Now I think I can find a way to do this on my own. So tell me about your first steps then. I mean, did you, did you have clients in place and then quit the job? Did you say, you know what, there's, there's, you know, no risk, no reward and jump in. What, how did you get that first client then? And what did it look like just setting out on your own? Yeah. Well, the, the way I got the first client is pretty interesting. Um, I became known for someone who could build training processes. And so once we did that for sales, we went to customer service, we went to uh, the field technicians, we went to all of these different departments and I started doing the same thing and was having similar success. And so word travels fast, word of mouth, people started to leave the company and they would go to work at their new place and they're like, man, our training really sucks here. Hey, Tony, can you come here and do the thing that you did there? And so it happened really, really organically. And so for a while, my, my business was kind of like most consultants, it was like feast or famine, right? I'm like, I don't know if I can depend on this full time because when people are calling and they really want training, like that's really cool because I can have these big, big days. I may have a, a month where we do um, $10,000 or $15,000 and that's really cool. And then the next month we may do no thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so it was like, oh, that's that's not that's not going to work. And so I had to like formalize how I was going to uh, get new customers. And that was uh, I don't want to say it was easy for me to do, but like I, I started in sales. Right. So I knew that if I can get in front of the right people, um, I could I could sell them on what I had to offer. And I knew what I had to offer was valuable, but it definitely took some time to figure out that aspect of it so that I wasn't held prisoner to the feast of famine nature of of a lot of businesses and so but that the first customer was literally a phone call uh, uh inbound lead if you will of someone who heard about what i did or experienced it and was just like hey can you do that and even to this day i mean five four or five years later um we do all of our business for the most part are inbound leads like people reaching out to us but just now there's a there's a system to it and an approach to it that um, makes that happen continuously that I don't have to worry about the feast or famine of of, of consulting anymore. But yeah, yeah. this one was literally that phone call. Sounds like it's all feast for you now, man. Congratulations. It is all feast, no famine. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> nice, nice. So let's say you got somebody out there on that that Reddit channel and they're looking at this, right? And they're saying, why, why aren't I? I mean, how would you, how would you recommend? I mean, they're, they're sitting there and they're, they're in similar situation. Let's say they're, they're earning 50,000 and they're seeing what they're doing is, is creating value. They're feeling unappreciated. Yeah. What's their first steps? What do you tell them to do? Well, mindset first, right? And so there's probably a lot of things for a multitude of reasons that will mentally stop you from taking the jump um, when you should, right? So I had that experience, I want to say in 2015 or 16. Um, I didn't start taking clients until 2018. And then I didn't like formalize the business and go after it until 2020. So why would that happen, right? Like you, 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 you show that you could make, generate $3 million with this change. Why wouldn't you just immediately go and say, okay, I'm, I, this is what I do now. I do this. Well, a lot of it was the programming from you know, uh, childhood, parents, loved ones, the educational system, uh, all these things that tell you that, um, you know, 
you got to work hard for your money, right? Or you uh, got to make X amount of dollars per hour, or, you know, a job is more secure and more safe than a business. And like all of these things, like if you, you gotta, you gotta work, uh, you know, eight hour shifts and like all these things that we have been uh, told or programmed to believe is probably like what's stopping you or man, you know, business is too much of a headache. And it's like, is it really, you know, what's a headache, you know, what's a he it's a headache to sit in an hour long meeting while people have idea contests and never get anything done. Like that's a headache. I, I, I hate corporate meetings where we sit around and like, well, that's a good idea. Well, how about my idea? How about my and next thing you know, we're 15 minutes over. We haven't done anything. And now we got to schedule another meeting to talk about the meeting that we just had so that we can have the meeting about the thing that we need to actually do. Like that's a headache, right? Um, the idea that someone else is going to be responsible for how you feed your family on a consistent basis and they can make a decision that has no, um, no, bearing on like your performance but impacts your income like that that's a headache but there's all these mental blocks that that um people put in their own way that will stop them from starting the business a lot of people try to tell themselves how hard or how difficult it's going to be before they ever attempt to try it right it's like those people it's like oh i hate brussels sprouts it's like how well have you ever tried them no but i just don't like how they look it's like well you don't know yeah. if you like brussels sprouts or not by the way, Brussels sprouts today are totally different than women. They're delicious. They're like, <laughs> I love them, man. They did to them. They had a rebrand, one of the greatest rebrands in history. But like, those are the types of things that I hear from people. It's just like, oh, I just don't know if I can do it. Or um, one of the things that I used to think is like, okay, that worked here that one time. I don't know if I could do it other places. And so like, I like went to go work other places. Like, okay, that was a small startup company. There were 600 employees. There were 3,000 when I left. Let me go see if I can do it at a big company. So I went to a 20,000 person organization and achieved the same similar results. I'm like, okay, well, what if there's nothing, right? Like, what if I'm employee number three? What if, what if that happens, right? What if I'm a trading team of one and I don't have any help? Can I do it then? And so then like I went and did it then and I was like, okay, I'm fooling myself. Obviously I could do this. Like, obviously this is something that works. And so I had to get rid of all the head trash and all the programming and all the thoughts that weren't serving me and weren't in my best interest and move those things aside before I could ever go about the business of like being an entrepreneur and generating leads and how to put together pitch decks and proposals and close and like all those things. I couldn't even get to that because the mental blocks were stopping me from taking action. You know, it reminds me of something um, I read somebody, I don't remember where I saw it, but it was something like, if you wait until you think you're ready to have kids, you're never going to have kids. That's true. Right. You will, you never, what you see coming, what you think you need to be ready. That's not what's going to happen at all. Right. Yeah. So just you, you, I wonder if it's the same way with business. You, how many people are sitting out there saying, well, if I learn this, I'll do it then. And if I get this degree, I'll do that. And maybe I get this certificate and then I'll be ready. And when I'm ready, then I go. That's but it right. sounds like you're saying, go, I mean, stop, stop stalling basically yeah. there's a difference between like being ready and being prepared right like okay. being prepared means that you have the skills that like some of the requisite skills to like get started being ready means like you know it's going to work and you're never going to know what's going to work i'm about to launch a new program in the next month and i have no idea if it's going to work if it does it'll be incredible if it doesn't it'll be like ah okay next thing yeah right? That sounds crazy to you if you are someone who has a uh, adverse reaction to failure. And like, if you do, I'm not mad at you, right? Because you were told in, in school since you were a little kid that failure was bad. And that works really well in the game of school, right? You get something wrong, they knock it off, they get points off and it's like, oh, you failed, that's bad. But like in the game of life and in the game of business, failure is like really, really good because yeah. that's where all the lessons are. Right. And John Maxwell likes to say, uh, sometimes you win and sometimes you learn that like, that's it. The, the only time failure is truly a loss is when it exists in the absence of accountability. Tell like me, it, about, we, we've got a few minutes left. Um, but tell me about your company now. How's it going? Company now in Gallo, uh, we are a leadership and development training company. Um, 
things are going super well. Like I couldn't be more happy uh, than where we are now. We get the opportunity to work with clients uh, all over the United States and even some international clients on uh, developing, designing and delivering world-class training programs. And so that ranges from building out those training processes for new hire programs, building out uh, management programs, emerging leader programs, and then we get to design and deliver those things too. And so we are we are doing well and we are just getting started. I'm super excited about it. So you went from feast or famine to international clients in five years. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, all, fa all, all feast, no famine. Man, that's amazing and it's impressive. You know, it sounds like uh, when you're on the on the Reddit, it sounds like you want to be a mentor to to yeah. other people too. Is that something you're open to? I'm 100% open to that. Yeah, I've had so many mentors that help me. I, I can't help but to help other people. Okay, so if someone wants to reach out to you, how do they get a hold of you? Actually, what they can do, um, they could go to tonyrsanders.com forward slash LLFL. And I'm going to do... Uh, a free video training to teach them like how to get started landing corporate clients in a training company. If, that, if people are interested in that, if you're not interested in that or you're not sure you're still on the fence, like maybe go figure that out first. But if you really want to get into the training uh, business as a consultant and you, you're like, your concern is like, okay, well, how do I get clients? Where do they come from? Because that's usually the first concern. Uh, I'm going to do a free training that people can take there if they listen to this podcast. They won't see that link anywhere else. Excellent. All right, man. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. You know, we try to, to carry on the memory of uh, my mentor, Bob Pike. And so one of the ways I'm trying, to, and I forget to do this, but I'm trying to end these podcasts by encouraging you, you all the same way that Bob Pike encouraged me, encouraged all of you. And that's, you know, leave this podcast, go out, add value, and make a difference. Tony, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.